Welcome to the Art of Love podcast. My name is Tamar Gale, and I am here to guide you into deeper, more expansive love, freedom, and pleasure. A deep inner journey of self-discovery. Here, I will cover all types of topics pertaining to love, including self-love and self-care, relationships, tantra, intimacy, sex, all the way to Christ consciousness, and Pashamama, just to name a few broad topics. My mission is to support you in being true to yourself, reconnecting the fragmented pieces and aspects of yourself so that you can find and use your own inner fire, Shakti power, and voice. It is time to break down the old systems that we have been taught to live by. I would love to see you align with your personal truth and nature instead of succumbing to others' views of how you should be trying to fit inside of the box in order to be accepted, and instead, standing in your power and loving all that you are, accessing a new way of being in the world. Hello, and thank you for listening to The Art of Love. Today, I am doing an interview with Stephanie McCandless. She's a self-care practitioner, yoga instructor, wellness coach, writer, speaker, business consultant, and lifelong student. Stephanie has had the privilege of coaching people from all over the world for more than a decade, She helps people navigate through various life issues while encouraging them to keep moving forward in alignment with their true north, their highest good and or purpose. She works with people on issues such as relationships, parenting, business, addiction, and self-discovery. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here today and uh, welcome to the Art of Love. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Thank you. And can you tell me a little bit about how you got involved with the work that you're doing now? It started out, it was a little more than a decade ago now, and I was working with people not purposefully, not intentionally set out to do this work. Literally, people would show up on my doorstep and need help. And generally, it was with emotional issues, spiritual issues, and I would literally figure out what they needed and learn as much as I could about it and meet with them again and teach them whatever I learned. And so that's how the first couple of years started. I would literally get a knock on my door or a phone call in the middle of the night of someone in a crisis of some sort, a marriage falling apart, relationships, whatever. And um, I would just eat up every tool that I could find in order to give that to them. Mm-hmm. And somewhere right about the first year of me doing this, I am very um, visual. That's how I learn. That's how um, I just feel like God speaks to me is through pictures. And I kept having this specific picture come to mind whenever I would meditate. And it was a friend of mine, and she was drowning in quicksand. And I was standing right in front of her, um, looking at the quicksand, looking at her, wanting to help. And I really didn't understand what I needed to do, what um, my role was, and how I could get this person out of the quicksand without um, sinking myself. And so in the little picture that I uh, saw, I noticed a tool shed back around the area where the quicksand was. And I went into the quick the tool shed and opened the doors, and there was tons and tons of tools. And I knew in my gut that everything I needed to help this woman out of the quicksand was in the shed, but I had no idea how to assemble the tools, how to put them together, and, and how to use them, what they were called. So that set me on a journey of learning tools. So I spent the next, well, I'm still doing it, so... Spent lots of time going to conferences, going through different training certifications, just trying to figure out how the soul works, how, you know, triggers and different things that life circumstances affect us, and then how to navigate through those issues the best way possible with, um, without causing further damage. And later on, I would revisit that same vision that I had during a meditation time. And it ended up that I was the woman in the quicksand. But I wouldn't have set out on the journey to figure out all the tools if it would have been for me. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So it was one of those little things that a lot of times that we get the help that we need by helping other people because we wouldn't set out on the journey and be so diligent if it was just for us, even though <laughs> we should. Mm. I love that. That's so true. And so many times what we need to find within ourselves and kind of go through in ourselves, heal within ourselves is, is kind of our path of what we then end up guiding others to do. And I love that you went on that journey and just dived right into, in order to help this woman who turned out to be you, but dived right into just going after what God was calling you to. What you were being told to do, you just went right after it. And I just admire that so much. I love that. Thank you. For the first um, several years, I focused mainly in the emotional wellness and the spiritual wellness. and But I felt like there was a big, huge piece missing. Mm-hmm. I kept seeing people come to me for help, and they had the same physical manifestations in their body. Um, tight back, sore hips, you know, shoulders rounded. I began to notice people with rounded shoulders that were also... Um, paralyzed with shame and fear Mm -hmm. and noticing that these physical symptoms are lining up together with their emotional issues. And so about, well, I don't remember. My timelines are bad. (laughs) (laughs) Unless I've given birth that year. I can't remember what year it was. (laughs) Um, But I started uh, really looking into the physical body and how trauma and emotional um, just life circumstances that hit us deep down within our soul can affect our physical body and how stress manifests. For myself, I had the same thing happen to me, um, and that really sent me even further looking into the physical body. But I had what they called a perfect storm, where I had been sick for about a year, battling strep throat and different things. So I was on antibiotics within a six month time period, at least 10 times. And so I just couldn't get over this infection. I had recently had a hysterectomy. And so my hormones were out of whack. I was, I had no self care practice whatsoever. I was busy taking care of every person on this earth, except for me, always putting everyone's needs in front of my own. And I had an adrenal blowout and complete compassion fatigue to the point that I was in bed for about two months, suffering migraines, could not get hydrated, Mm -hmm. just literally could not do anything. And that's when I decided, okay, if I'm going to do this for others, I'm going to do this for myself first. And I literally took a year off of doing anything and just focused on my own body, my own emotional wellness, and my own spiritual needs. Mm -hmm. And that shifted everything in my life. And so now I feel way more empowered because before I just felt like I was regurgitating someone else's information. And it was helpful, and I know I helped people. But now I come at it from a completely different perspective. And I try not to teach someone else something that I'm not currently practicing or haven't practiced in the past which was not the way I went about it when I began. And you have, you have a large family. Yes. Very. (laughs) (laughs) So um, finding that time for self care, because I know a lot of women and and men struggle with it, but um, I know that, that women as mothers and in the workforce and, and having careers, we do take on a lot. Um, How did you go about doing that with such a large family? And how did you feel in the beginning of having to make that step of, okay, I need to put my health um, as make that a priority? And because I know a lot of women struggle with that. Yeah. And I did too. My time. Yeah. I really struggled with the guilt. I wouldn't do things for myself. Mm-hmm. When I got really stressed out, I'd go get a massage. Mm-hmm. But really, that was my only act of self-care was a massage. I'd drink a smoothie every morning, get a massage about once every other month, mm-hmm. and think that I was good. Yeah. But my diet was basically sugar and caffeine, trying mm-hmm. to you know, just get going, making it through that day. And 
I would exercise if I could, but yeah. it would be like, I just need to go for a 15 minute run because that's the quickest thing that I can do to burn the most calories. And so I was not a priority and my health had just kept going downhill to the point, like I said, I was in bed for two months and whenever that happens, you are not taking care of anyone that needs you. Oh. My family realized how important I was. How <laughs> much that I did. I was sure. Unable to do it. And so when women tell me they do not have the time, I tell them eventually you're going to have to make the time because something is going to happen in your body to where you can't move forward like you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, we were not created to survive. You know, we should be in alignment with our true self, thriving every day. And I, I have five children. Um, they keep me very busy, activities every day. I'm a full-time student. I decided to go back to school to pursue psychology because, you know, I am a lifelong student and I love to learn. I work. You know, I do a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and my self-care is still top priority because at the end of the day, people watch TV. Mm-hmm. People are on their phones. There's always time. Yeah, you know, we can find time for what's important. Yeah. And I've had to say no to a lot of things. I've learned that no is a complete sentence and I do not have to justify my no's. Yeah. I can just say no. And, you know, especially being involved into a small school system again, you know, everybody does everything and I have to really think through if I say yes to this, what am I saying no to? That's important to me. Mm-hmm. And I have to prioritize my yeses. Mm-hmm. And so I really have never sat down with anyone that will go through their daily schedule with me that we can't find the time for them to at least do 20 minutes of self-care a day. Yes. I mean, most people spend 20 minutes on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And so you can do it. Yeah. It's the pri- that prioritizing. And I, I love what you said about no being a complete sentence. And I find that a, a lot of the women I work with, and I'm sure you found the same thing. Um, no is so difficult. No, we're programmed exactly. not to say no, and if we do say no, offer three excuses. Yeah, and sometimes and that's how people know. pleasers are formed. And yeah. I was a complete people pleaser to the point that I would do things for people and literally have anger and hatred in my heart. Yeah. But I was the one, like they had no idea that I didn't want to do whatever it was that I was doing because I would gladly smile. Yes, I'll do that for you. Mm -hmm. And then my heart would be so ugly. And, you know, that's a way that we move away from our authentic self. When we say yes to things that we should be saying no to, we step further and further away from our authentic self because you can't live an authentic life and do things that you don't want to do on a daily basis. That's such wise words. You can't live an authentic life and do things on a daily basis that you don't want to do that, Mm -hmm. you know, now I'm not saying, you know, I worked at the Santa shop. Sometimes I do things like I don't want to do those, you know, (laughs) but my kids are in school. I want them to take part of these programs. So I know I have to give back. But I'm also very aware of my time constraints. And I will often say this to people when they ask for help. Do you need help? Mm. How do you need help? Mm. And Tell me exactly what you need. And I want to make sure that you actually need my physical body there. Because if I make the arrangements to show up and serve dinner and there's 11 people just standing around, I will be upset. Yeah. And I say that in a very kind way. Right. But so many times we say yes to things and rearrange our entire day and then get there and you're not even needed. Yeah. And so I make sure that when I say yes to a volunteer thing, for instance, that I'm actually needed, I'm going to serve a real purpose, or I make food at home and send it there because mm. then I can do it on my own time. And I think this is so important for women to, to learn. You know, we've got, we have such busy lives and the added stress on top of that of constantly feeling like we have to do and be everything for everyone else is such, is so ingrained in, in our society. And it, it comes from 
family being passed down. Um, and I've had to learn the same lesson of being able to say no and not be a people pleaser because what comes out is passive aggressiveness. And that's quite, that was quite hard for me to, to realize within myself, Oh, I'm not that. And actually when you realize what you're doing to yourself, Mm -hmm. it's like, it's a, it was a huge wake up call for me because if I can't find alignment with peace and joy every day, mm -hmm. it's something within myself. It's yeah. nothing that anyone else is creating. Yeah. And so then I have to look at my life. Okay. Mm -hmm. What did I do? Yeah. That's caused me so much frustration and resentment. And how do I need to shift to that? Because mm -hmm. it's not the people asking me. Yeah. You know, it's not their fault. They're just putting it out there. And if I take on that pressure, I will say with my first child, I had a lot of mom guilt mm -hmm. and I did everything because I thought I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. And so now that I have a 10 year old after, you know, four others, I can easily look at people and say, yeah, I, I can't do that. Sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, these are the ways that I can help, but I'm not going to come to every meeting. I'm not going to do those things, but you let me know. <laughs> if there's something specific you need help with and I'll see if I can work it in my schedule. And that's honest communication. That's authentic way of living. You know, that's being like authentic power because you're saying exactly what you need in order to take care of yourself and set boundaries. And I love that. Mm. Yeah, And I will gladly help people that really need help. Yeah. And, um, I have just found that a lot of the stuff that we get involved in is busy work mm -hmm. that has no lasting impact. And so I'm fine with going to the school and cleaning if that's what I need to do, mm -hmm. but I don't want to do it alongside of 10 other people that are just standing around not doing anything because that's a waste of time. And so find two people that can really do it and we can get it done quick. <laughs> You know, and that's just one example, but we, we do that so many times we have to say yes to everything and then we're not really needed. And then that's where that resentment and bitterness starts to fester. Mm -hmm. And then you start to just judge all these people, all these things over something that you're creating in your own life. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so now what do you do for your own self-care? Like, how do you practice self-care for yourself now with such I know some of your kids are you know are a little bit older now but which makes it so much easier <laughs> <laughs> but you still have a young one at home also yeah I have three at home and two in college yeah and for me I'm really big about mindful movement okay. so the people I work with we start the first two months of only doing five minutes of mindful movement a day Mm -hmm. And I say mindful movement because a lot of people will say, well, I walked to the mailbox. That counts. I, you know, stood and did dishes. I was on my feet. No, I'm talking about set an alarm, have an appointment with yourself and do five minutes of dancing or jumping jacks or jump rope or anything that you want to do. Um, you know, it's about moving your body, but it's also about bringing joy to your heart. So I love it when people just five minutes of dancing a day. Yeah, oh, I and love people. People aren't comfortable with their bodies and that's fine. So start somewhere else and work up to that. And then as we work through the program, we begin to add minutes to where we can at least get three times a week of mindful moving for 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm lucky I teach and generally... I demo at least half of the class three times a week to get my own mindful movement and movement in, um, especially like when I'm doing mat Pilates, because, you know, that's a class that's easily demoed through the whole class almost, but I don't skip a week. If I'm sick, if something's, you know, not going well, I'll give myself permission to skip a couple of days of the five minutes, but I don't skip the 45 minutes. Um, three times a week at least. That's my that's my rules, and um, I give myself permission and grace all of the time. You know, because things happen. But I also know at the end of the day, I want to be my best self, mm -hmm. and for me to do that, I have to take care of my physical body. Um, my other self care practices, you know, 
is centered around what I put in. I try to think about everything that I eat or drink being life-giving or poison. Mm -hmm. And that's a harsh way to look at it. But I kind of had to be a little tough on myself because I am a recovering sugar addict. And I will still engage in a good sugar cookie. (laughs) (laughs) But I will do so mindfully (laughs) and on purpose, not just by grabbing it and eating it. I will say, okay, I'm going to have a sugar cookie today. Where do I want it to be from? Because I'm not going to waste it on mediocre sugar Mm -hmm. cookies. (laughs) I will be purposeful about it. Um, For me, what works is I get three sweet treats a week. And Mm -hmm. that sounds really boring. But that's the way that I can still partake and then not be in the sugar fog. And I think that's a great idea because when you completely cut something out, that craving doesn't just go away. Right? Yeah, we still need to enjoy those little pleasures, but consciously. Yeah. And And there's a difference in between eating one brownie and eating the pan of brownies. (laughs) And before I, you know, like all women, I've struggled with my weight, but we're talking like 10 pounds. I've not had real weight issues, Mm -hmm. but I would know if I ate a plate of brownies that I just wouldn't eat the rest of the day because I understand calories. So I was able to maintain my weight with still horrible eating habits Okay. So for me, it's about making sure that I'm taking in the right things instead of really depriving myself of the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So I try to make sure that I have five vegetables a day. I drink a smoothie that has green powder and protein powder in it. And besides that, I don't really pay attention to what I eat. I just try to really make sure that I'm taking those good things in. I'm not partaking in sweet treats. I don't measure out like what sugar is in food that I eat and stuff like that. But as far as like, I'll have three cupcakes a week (laughs) or whatever it is, but I want to eat it on purpose. Not just grabbing something that the kids has, you know, there's always starbursts in my house. If I give myself permission to eat those, I will eat them until they're gone. And I don't want to waste my sweet treats on that. So (laughs) I don't do that. Um, But as far as self-care goes for me, I really focus on my emotional wellness. Mm -hmm. Every day I do affirmations. Um, I start my day with putting my hand on my heart, laying in bed before I get out of bed. And I think about inhaling light, love, and peace. And exhaling anything that's not serving my highest, greatest good. Beautiful. I um, am very aware if fear is driving me and I immediately will switch driver's seats because I know that fear is not a good guide. Mm -hmm. And for the past, you know, the first 30 years of my life, fear is what mainly guided me, whether it was fear of man, you know, just perfectionism, which is a root of fear Mm -hmm. (laughs) and all of these other driving forces that I, you know, led my life, I know does not serve me. Yeah. So I'm, I scan and just make sure, okay, who's driving me today? Who's my guide? Cause it can't be fear. (laughs) Elizabeth Gilbert says, you know, fear can um, be in the car with you, but it has to stay in the back seat. It can't drive. It doesn't even get to decide what's on the radio. I love that line. Yeah. (laughs) But it's there, so we don't drive off the cliff. (laughs) But other than that, it doesn't have a place in my life. Yeah. And then I really look after um, what lies I believe about myself Mm -hmm. and go after that. There's always something being revealed, an area where I need to grow capacity to love. Mm -hmm. And I just search for those places every day. And I think that every circumstance that we go through is a teacher. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn the lessons from those events, from those circumstances and see how, you know, the message, what the message is and how we can realign with love and what lesson that we can learn from it so we could grow our capacity for love. Mm -hmm. Because the first half of my life, I had a very small capacity for unconditional love, especially for myself. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to live that way anymore. And that was the other huge revelation for me was I get to decide how I live. And that in itself is powerful. Mm -hmm. And I take that very seriously. Every breath, every minute that I'm here, 
I get to decide how I spend it. And that's important to me to make sure that when I lay down at night, I can say, okay, this was a good day. Even if bad things happened, because I know that those bad things can be lessons. Yeah. Yeah. I find that those lessons just take us deeper into love when we open up to them. You know, those hard moments in our life, there's just another, as you say, another lesson. And those cracks, those pains, those hurts, there's always a light there. There's always a light shining at the bottom of that that can help us grow deeper into love of self and love of those around us. It's just deepening that unconditional love. And I I don't know if um, maybe you've felt the same, that our society is, we don't really, we're not really um, grown into unconditional love. No. no. We think we are. We think that's what we do, but it's, it's really conditional most of the time. Yeah. For sure. And even understanding what unconditional love means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell people when I'm working with them with relationship issues, mm -hmm. you have to either decide to love the person that you're with just as they are. Mm -hmm. Not the person that you see within them, not, you know, what they say they want to be, Yeah. but look at them in the eyes and say to yourself, I love this person just as they are. That's what unconditional love is. Yeah. And in relationships, if we can't do that, there's an issue. Mm -hmm. And so you either have to get to that spot where you accept them just as they are today without any change or let them go. Because holding on to relationship because you think they're going to change or, you know, you think that you can help them change, which was always <laughs> lead you down a path so that is just not good mm -hmm. uh, but really beginning to look at the person and saying I love you just as you are I accept you which is actually easier than looking in the mirror and saying I love you just as you are I accept you today yeah and that's been a huge part of my self-care practice as well because I am a very driven person mm -hmm. And I always have so many goals, so many things that I'm working on. It was very difficult for me to say, okay, Stephanie, I love you just as you are. Mm -hmm. And I accept all the broken pieces of you where before I would be, I would think things, I wouldn't say them out loud, of course, <laughs> but I would think things like, well, whenever I get here, mm -hmm. I'll be able to love myself. Mm -hmm. And that's just not, that's not unconditional love. Yeah. And if we can't find it for ourselves, we can't find it for another human being. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what changed my whole, that's what brought me on my mm -hmm. was, was that sense of love, of realizing it one day that I couldn't tell myself that I loved, I love you. You know, I couldn't look in the mirror and say, I love you. Mm -hmm. And that just shattered, you know, that was just a mind blowing moment and completely changed my life. You know, and that's exactly what I told myself. How do you expect to love someone else or allow someone else to love you if you can't love yourself? And so it took me on a path of just healing, you know, doing lots of healing within myself of childhood wounds and, you know, things that we all have. Almost every one of us has something in our life that has traumatized us in that way. And um, it's just when we can come to that realization and see that and from an adult perspective and re-love that child within us, it's just, it's a, it's, it's a huge moment. Yeah. Another um, big motivating picture that I would see after meditating was I was standing in front of this huge mirror and it was a life-size mirror. It reminded me of um, the mirror on Harry Potter whenever mm -hmm. he's able to see his family. Yeah. Um, but I would stand in front of that mirror and I was naked and I had a really hard time looking at myself um, naked um, in the vision and probably in real life because mm -hmm. I don't know that I would ever stand there and, you know, just stare at myself in that way. 
And I was standing there looking at myself in this mirror and the mirror shattered and the pieces just scattered over time and space. Mm -hmm. And in my gut, I knew that all those little broken pieces were, were parts of myself that I had neglected and just blocked out and shoved away. And it was like all those things that bring us shame Mm -hmm. and all the things that we regret. And then, you know, those traumatizing experiences and, and other life circumstances that were just negative that you don't want to deal with. And I had just scattered my pieces all over the place. And I knew that I needed to get to the place where I could love and accept every single shard of glass that represented who I was in the past, Mm -hmm. which was a hard journey (laughs) because, you know, we are conditioned as a society to smile, to put on a mask, to just show up and pretend, fake it till you make it. Yeah. Sometimes we need to close off and we need to mourn the loss and mourn the loss of what could have been, what we thought was going to happen and really let go Mm -hmm. and then accept all those pieces back. Yeah. Just as they are. And love them. Yes. And love them fully and understand that we really, I have not met a person on this earth that didn't do the best that they could with the knowledge that they had. Mm-hmm. And that'll help us forgive people that's hurt us. You know, just understanding people's capacity for love, people's capacity to care for us. You know, we all have just a, a specific capacity level that we can engage with other humans. Mm-hmm. And some people's capacities are smaller than others and they hurt us. But it's so few, t- it's so many few times that. It's ever intentional. You know, most people do the best they can with what they have. And that always helps me give grace to people and and forgive people and let go of the past and all the judgments that I've had in my heart because of this, that, and the other thing. And then from that place, I was able to understand it for myself. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I was doing the best I could with the information that I had with the love that I felt Mm -hmm. because when we feel unlovable, we do unlovable things and that's just it. And that's why the world is so messy. Beautiful. Beautiful. And, you know, I get a lot of criticism about self care being selfish. (laughs) That's what we want to bring up. Yes. yeah, Yeah. And it, you know, I just had this full conversation with someone about this. Mm -hmm. Um, that self care is creating, you know, the the criticism is self care is keeping especially women away from their priorities, away from their families, you know, all of this guilt that we should, I mean, it's 2019. We should not be dealing with this. Um, and I just want to say to the that criticism for myself, I am so much of a better mother Mm -hmm. and a better wife and a better friend because I actually love myself Mm -hmm. instead of just pretending and going through the motions and doing the things that I thought I was supposed to do now, because I've tended to my own garden, I have fruit to give people. Yes. Yeah. And before I had no fruit. My life might have looked more together, <laughs> but, and I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. but it was all fake. Yeah. It was all fake. Yeah. We would, you know, our family could be fighting and yelling at each other and then go in and smile and pretend like everything was okay. And what we were giving were sour fruit. You know, it wasn't real. It wasn't authentic. Yeah. And now today, if you would come to my house and we had been screaming and fighting, I might say to you, I'm sorry, you might feel that it's tense. We're dealing with some family stuff. It's not serious. We'll work through it. Just give us some grace. <laughs> and that's real. Yeah. And that helps me stay aligned with my truth. Because when I lie, I put on masks mm-hmm. and those masks do not serve me. 
I have another friend joining us. <laughs> Talk about self-care. My cats are very much involved in my self-care practice because <laughs> they won't leave me alone. <laughs> they give good cuddles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that unconditional love that we're talking about. For sure. Yeah. I was always a dog person because I felt like they gave unconditional love. Mm-hmm. But nothing like a cat does. Yeah. Yeah. When you're a cat's person, you're a cat's person. Yeah. <laughs> I learned a lot from the cats and I did not really want to get them, but I've learned a lot about love from them. Again, anything can be our teachers. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And can you think of anything else that you think would be important to share on this topic of self care and self love? whenever they're trying to figure out how to work self-care into their daily life is the issue of finances. And there's a couple of ways to look at this. One thing to remember is what we spend our time, energy, and finances on is what is most important to us. And so there should be no guilt related to spending a little bit of your finances on your Mm, self-care. However, if you're truly in financial you know, in need of finances and you just can't make it work. There are so many things that you can do for free. There's great YouTube videos on exercises, um, just taking care of your body in a better way, running a bath, Mm -hmm. just being still at night when everybody's asleep, staying up 15 minutes later and just breathing in the quiet, going outside in the moonlight. Mm-hmm. You know, all of these things are inexpensive, if not free, that you can partake in every single day. And just waking up in the morning, saying a couple of affirmations, I am light, I am love, I am going to live my best life today. Mm-hmm. You know, something like that, setting the intention for the day, just helps guide everything that you're doing for that day. And doing little things throughout that you know is caring for your body, that's caring for your soul, that's caring for your mind. You know, really thinking about what you're thinking about, that's free. Yeah. Making sure all your thoughts are aligned with love and light, especially for yourself. You know, none of these things cost money. And so you can always find a way. Mm -hmm. And just taking that inventory of what you're spending your time and your energy and your finances on and seeing where you can um, cut back in certain areas so that you can give more in others. And so for me, I stopped eating out as much. I, I loved to go to restaurants all the time. And I just cut that budget in half so I could spend it on things that I felt served my body better, Mm -hmm. like a massage or pedicures or coaching or whatever it is that I feel like I need at that moment. But there's always things that we can cut out and and reprioritize so that we can do the things that's going to serve us long term. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I find that's really important for um, for everyone to know uh, that there are free things to do, and that's that's I've done that. You know, like I would get on YouTube and and watch yoga videos or Pilates or whatever it was, dance videos, whatever it was that I needed at that time um, when I was in those financial places of not being able to go out and and spend that money on on those things that I needed. Um, and then when I could, uh, what I found was having that support, you know, having someone there to, to hold me accountable, to show me things that maybe I couldn't see within myself, you know, to bring those things up and to help me on a path that would bring me to my highest self and my highest vision of myself, um, did remarkable like changes in my life. And I can't, I can never replace that. Yeah, exactly. And I still do that today. You know, I still look for you know, a great coach or someone that could be there as my support and, and guide me to the next version of myself. And it makes a total difference. It brings us up, you know, in, in finances, in 
health in, in every aspect of our life. Yeah. So I think I, that, that was a great, great point to share. And yes, thank you. And I always um, am either enrolled in an online class mm -hmm. or I have a specific coach that has worked with me for years, mm -hmm. knows me intimately and knows how to help me shift quickly. Yeah. And I can, you know, now our calls can be super short because I'm like, I, I know the tools. Mm -hmm. We just need that outside perspective. Yeah. That's one of the things that I think people don't realize is so invaluable when working with people one-on-one -on -one is we look at our lives through blinders and we only see in part. And sometimes we need that outside perspective to just show us the biggest picture, mm -hmm. the bigger picture, and look at things from different angles. And mm -hmm. when we have that, we can shift so quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely worth it. And I know that our society at one point, and I think it's changing, has always looked at therapy or coaching or something like that as that meant something was wrong with you. And, and that's how it was, that's how it was seen. And so there's a, there could be a fear around, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't need that. Um, and it's actually a, a negative, you know, like look at what that actually, if we actually look at what that is, it's supporting us to be our greatest self. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with us. You know, we may have some things to look at some things to love a little bit, a little bit deeper within ourselves, but there's nothing wrong with us. Mm -hmm. No, and I love that. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because there's so much stigma around not being perfect. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I have not met that perfect person. <laughs> I've met a lot of people that I thought were perfect. Yeah. And then when I have a conversation with them, I think, oh, wow, they're just like me. Yeah. The world is messy. Yeah. It's not black and white. It's mainly gray or filled with color, however you want to say it. <laughs> and the world is messy. And I so enjoyed my time in Florida, spending times in the swamp. Mm -hmm. Because before I really got to see the Everglades and understand what a swamp really looks like, I would think of myself as a coach, as someone that holds the light up. Mm. and helps navigate people through the swamp. Mm. And so I had an experience in the Everglades one time where I'm like, yeah, this is exactly what it's like. There's alligators, there's snakes, there's things that come after us, there's obstacles, but yet we can always move forward mm. if you can see the light, mm. if you can see where you need to go. Yeah. And I've always thought that about, you know, people that are intuitive that can really connect with others in such a way, you know, we help shine the light on where the forward is. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a beautiful gift that we shouldn't feel um, weird about sharing with the world because people need it. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And do you have any last Thing that you would love to share with everyone about self-care, self-love, your journey? I think the biggest thing that hinders people is just feeling like it's too hard. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's important for people to know baby steps. Yeah. You know, every day doing one thing and then adding to that thing. Yeah. And so when I work for, with people, I like to do it over a six-month time period because I like to move very slow mm -hmm. because I know that slow generally sticks. And when people, you know, I do take personal inventories on New Year's and on my birthday, and I do, you know, use that time to just realign myself to what I think I should be moving forward in. But... My caution in that is a lot of times we try to make these huge adjust adjustments to our life and then we fail. We can't, we can't change everything. You can't, you know, change the direction of a ship overnight. You just can't do it. 
And so I have found changing one thing at a time, really focusing on that one thing until it's a part of your soul. It's a part of who you are and then adding another thing. Mm. And then that's the way you change your lifestyle. Um, but really taking the time to just learn about yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the first step in self care is what brings you joy? What brings you peace? Mm. Because that's something I didn't know for the longest time. I was just doing the things that other people told me to do. Yeah. And it took a long time for me to understand what truly brings my soul peace, what brings my soul joy. And just giving yourself permission to discover those things and, and then trying it and taking the time once a week to try new things, to just experience life in a different way, to see what resonates with your heart. And, you know, I do think that there are lots of great information from lots of people that can help you discover those things. But really, if you just get alone with yourself and get quiet, they'll mm -hmm. usually rise up. Yeah. And sitting in stillness should not be scary. That's the other thing. Shavasana is my favorite yoga pose, and it is also the most difficult for the most people. Yeah, it's usually when they get up and leave, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And Shavasana is where we meet ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so getting alone, sitting in stillness, relaxing, just focusing on our breath, that's whenever your next steps will rise up mm -hmm. because that's when we're quiet enough to listen to our soul. Yeah. And that's the other thing. I do believe that our soul is always guiding us and telling us what we need. We just have to listen, be engaged, and, and then just really open to whatever the message is. Thank you so much. And could you tell us um, how someone could connect with you? Yes, so I my um, Facebook page is Soul Care with Stephanie McCamless, mm -hmm. and definitely on Facebook. Also, my website is just www.stephaniemccamless.com. Right now, I primarily work with people one on one. Um, however, hopefully by March, I will have um, an online course for Soul Care that people can engage in. My goal is to make things more affordable for people mm. not everyone can afford to work one-on-one -on -one, but in a group setting through a course we can make the prices lower and more people can be reached and so that's really what I'm trying to focus on right now and then um, who knows what will happen after that I love that I love that. I really want to go back to Italy soon. Have a retreat. I was going to ask you about your retreats. Yes, yeah. you, you've, had, you've led an amazing retreat in Italy the past two years? It was last October. Okay. And, um, there's works in another one. You know, I'm not ready. We don't have enough information yet. But I'm also doing a spring retreat in Indiana the first weekend of May. Okay. And I know I already have somebody signed up from, you know, they're going to have to fly in. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, cool I'm like, well, Southern Indiana is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it is. That's, that's a beautiful area. Yeah. And mm -hmm. right now, um, again, I don't have it set, but you can check my website for more information because I'm going to be setting everything up in the next couple of weeks. But I'm looking at the West Baden Resort, which mm -hmm. is a really interesting place in French Lick. And it's just a beautiful um, facility, beautiful place. And that's what I like. I like um, to be able to get into nature. Yeah. And, you know, practice in the grass and be outside in the places of beauty. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's where we all connect to each other, to source. Yes. Yeah. It's the best place to be. Oh, yeah. I love that. And thank you so much for sharing about that. And they can find that information on your website, right? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I thank you so much for joining me today and uh, for sharing your wisdom and your story. And I look forward to connecting with you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie.
And thank you everyone for joining us for episode one of The Art of Love. And I look forward to connecting with you again next Wednesday. May we go out into the rest of this week embodying more love, love for ourselves, love for others, and love for Pashamama, Mother Earth. So love to each and every one of you and see you next week.